Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in our new monthly webinar series, AI Analytics and Automation with Nick White. Today, Nick will discuss AI and data management. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the chat or the Q&A panels, you'll find the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing links to the slides and a recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And now let me introduce the speaker of this monthly series, Nick White. Nick is a seasoned professional with over two decades of expertise, is dedicated to driving impactful business outcomes through the strategic application of data, analytics, and AI. His extensive experience spans diverse industries, showcasing a passion for leveraging data's transformative potential to fuel innovation, optimize decision-making and streamline operations. Nick is recognized for his adeptness in assisting organizations across various industry verticals, consistently achieving positive business results through data-driven strategies. And with that, let me give the floor to Nick to begin his presentation. Hello and welcome. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me, everybody. Great to see you. Uh, we got some folks from everywhere, and I'm not leaving out Phoenix or Bloomington, but it's great to see you all. Um, and I'm really excited about this. Uh, this is one I've been waiting for. This is going to definitely be a little bit of a preview of what's to come uh, later in this web series. So without further ado, I just first want to do a little bit of housekeeping here. And that is just to remind everybody that this is actually the fourth of six that we're gonna do this year. Yeah, we're taking November and December off because of the holidays, but um, this is where we are. If you want to go back and take a look at any of the previous sessions that we've done, you know, a lot of people ask uh, many questions as we have gone through the second and third and they were covered in the first. So you will get this, this presentation has links to all these and we're right here um in the dog days of august so august 27th um next month we have intelligent automation and then we wrap up the year uh, with ai for good so we need to talk about that um in general um i'm pretty informal i'm not that funny but i will try some data jokes and i will ask for interaction you know feel free to do it in the chat not looking for anything crazy um, definitely with ChatGPT, if you want to speak German or you want to speak Spanish from Argentina, I will figure it out because I use AI every day for everything. Um, here are the personas that I try to aim to help with. And you can tell me which one of these you are if you want or if you're all of them. But, you know, I know most of our community, we're data professionals and I'm, I'm lumping us all together because we definitely do need to be lumped together because we have to work as a team. And we also have to work with our business users. And to get any funding or anything done, of course, we need to work with leaders. So this is um, this is definitely, I am here to cover things for these three personas. And if you want to drop me a note, you see those little questions. If you want to drop me a note and let me know which one you identify most with um, or where you're from. Uh, it's oppressively hot here in Madison, Wisconsin, if you can believe it. I'm not going to do the conversion into Celsius, but we have a heat advisory. So uh, just know it does get hot in Wisconsin and it's not all snow. So here we go. We're going to zoom out and do the big picture. We're going to talk about what does it mean to enable AI. I, You're going to hear me say this over and over again. Too many times we are separating AI from analytics Let's keep it as part of analytics. And then you kind of have your applied AI or your applied analytics, which is, you know, some of the stuff that you do after you've done the analytics. So you're going to see me keep on repeating that because I think one of the big problems we have right now, you know, outside of probably this group hot in here. Yeah, that's, yeah, Nashville, I don't want to be in Stacy. Um, so I did live in Virginia for a while and I can just say, if you haven't been to the Mid-South, Mid-Atlantic, South, Asheville, well, at least you're in the mountains. I've been there. 
if you haven't been to some some part of the southern United States in the summer, you're in for a treat because you're already soaked through your shirt at 7 a.m. Um, so let's zoom out to the big picture. You're going to see, oh, oh, Greensboro. Yeah, you got, you're all three, huh, Jennifer? Yeah, a lot of people, um, a lot of people from that Carolinas. My dad actually is uh, near Raleigh now. That's where he decided to retire to. And guess what? He says it's really hot in the, oh, Houston, don't even get me started. Chicago, love it, was just there. Um, let's talk about the big picture. All right, guys. So there, I know <laughs> all of us, yeah, look at that. Look at Melissa, you got a cooling front. All of us here know about this, but AI has been around for a while. Um, it's here to stay. I, I don't know how else to say it. Um, I know it's been around. We can <laughs> we can talk about Alan Turing if we want. But at the end of the day, what GPT and OpenAI has done, for better or worse, is that this is not going away. Um, and whether you're using it today or the people that you support today are using it, um, or even people you might support tomorrow, you know, there is a prediction that 60% will be using it a lot by the end of this year, which is just, if you go from zero to 60, um, that's pretty fast. So what are we looking at? Here are just the numbers, right? And the numbers are, you know, the software market, everybody's building things. How many startups do we see right now that just have AI? I joke about this, but I, I bought a new driver for golf this year. It has, it says AI on it. I'm just like, okay, enough's enough. Um, but at the end of the day, it is just, it's going to grow to like a $251 billion um, kind of uh, market, market um, segment. Not only that, but we all know, you know, AI is here. It's going to add a lot of value right now. And this is why I'm doing AI for good. So I'm going to do a little advertising for the next one. Um, but, you know, cutting humans is not quite the answer here. Um, it's it's all about how do we augment humans. But it is, look at that, $4.4 .4 trillion. That's a lot. Um, and just the amount of investments, right? Uh, $200 billion by 2025. So it's here to stay. There's a lot of money in it. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, yogurt comes bad, Mark. So I don't know what to tell you. Um, it's here to stay. And, and that's just, at the end of the day, we have to just settle up to this reality. It's not something we're waiting out like we did before. And if you've heard me talk, you'll hear me talk again. It has failed to deliver and it will continue to fail to deliver because people aren't thinking about the things that most of us on here already know. Um, it is the person you, I've actually seen, uh, you know, it's not AI that takes your job, but it, uh, I think it's the guy that points at his head for thinking. And it was just a meme that says, uh, you know, they can't replace your job with AI if your job is AI. So, oh, Alexandra. Jealous. Next year, we came to Spain this year. Um, but why does it fail? What I've seen is that it doesn't get integrated into processes. The end user experience lacks. And that's one of the big reasons why. You know, like if only 30 36% of the best companies are using AI, you know, in real time, that's not a lot. If 60% are going to use it by the end of this year, and everybody should be using it. You know, the fact that people aren't using it, it has something to do with, are we, you know, looking at it holistically, putting it into the process, putting it into the right application, making a good experience. I don't even want to talk about the second one. We all know that, right? We all know governance and quality make it not work. And the third, and the reason why I give you guys these slides too, is I know a lot of us have to go and justify why it's important to have good quality, good governance, good literacy. I put these just so you guys have, you know, some slides that you can use um, as you're selling up. Literacy and talent, um, you know, they fail and we're, we're still seeing it. We're not seeing a lot of things make it past pilot or POC because it people don't, the talent doesn't know how to scale it. 
and people don't know how to use it that are supposed to use it. So these are things that are true. We know this one. I hopefully this one is resonating with you. It's just not going away, guys. Um, let's, in our big zoom out too, let's just think about where does data and AI and the stuff that we care about fall into a modern digital product landscape, right? Mobile and web. We know those are the most popular experiences you're going to build, right? And this experience is the front end. This is what people are interacting with. Then you have those core systems. You know, man, <laughs> I've worked at places where we were still in mainframe or AS400. Feel free to um, pop into the chat. The most uh, old system that you get to work around, um, around enterprise core systems, but those aren't going away, right? You're going to need those, um, whether it's SAP or Salesforce or whatever, you're going to need those. And then all the edge cases, you know, we know, you know, we're talking about IoT, right? Like we have fridges now with it. Um, I wish my driver had it and could just, you know, adjust the way that I'm swinging when I'm about to hit a bad slice, but it doesn't. Um, and then just think about the wearable stuff, you know, it's there. All right. So that's experience. And then if we look at, let's go down to the foundation, cloud infrastructure, we got to be using it. Data management, we're all those types of peeps on here for the most part, or at least aware of it. Uh, DevOps, of course, like the modern way to deploy software is very important. And then you got to take advantage of the cloud. Um, I recently had somebody say, oh, how would I use, you know, what model do I use for on-prem stuff? Um, it's a question always. It's always interesting why people don't move to the cloud. There's still, people are still scared of it. Um, but if you're going to stay on-prem, you're mostly going to be going you know, um, all the way to, you know, open source. And then you're going to have to have a heck of a lot of talent to manage that. Atlassian, okay, man. Yeah, there's love-hate relationships. Where I want to focus our conversation today is in the ser service layer, right? Um, and you can see I've kind of, I've chunked it out, right? We know modern orchestration, modern service architecture, APIs, stuff like that. All right, so that's all the way on the right. We have AI and ML, you know, so let's consider anything AI and ML, you know, and I heard this explained to me in a very simple way, right? AI, ML, you're giving the computer or whatever you want to call it. I don't even know what to call it anymore. You're giving a system examples to then create their own rules. Traditional programming, let's say statistical analysis, let's say, you know, things that might be, you know, just we know what the actual process and decision should be, that's rule-based. Um, good point, Andy, good point. So yes, we're definitely working around some of, uh, some of the different regulations that are out there. So, when we think about service, let's think about, do we have examples that we want to tell a machine to learn from, or do we want to tell it exactly what to do? And that's how we would delineate rule-based and AI ML. And I'm gonna try something a little bit different. And here's where I kind of went into more detail, right? You know, so these are to support the user facing digital experiences while using the foundational elements. So I just kind of went through this, but what I like to point out is that analytics and statistics are rule-based. There's also rule-based automation. Um, but at the same time, automation can be called intelligent. And guess what? That's AI ML driven. That is using examples. That's not using steadfast rules. Um, and then you have different advanced analytics, you know, which I like to group AI ML into advanced analytics. And then there's rule-based analytics. So when you, this is kind of how it lays out in the service layer overview. All right. So that's the big picture. I want to introduce, and some of you from Europe, you might hate this team, whatever, but there's a reason why I'm going to do it because I'm also, I knew what we were going to have some Europeans and we're definitely having some North Americans. I saw some of my 
Canadian brethren. I'm originally from Detroit, which is Diet Canada, if you're not aware of. So there is a famous quote uh, from Gretzky, and it is that a good hockey player plays where the puck is. A great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. And I have a great example. This is, um, I'll be completely honest, Kevin De Bruyne, who is pictured here, is one of my favorite uh, footballers of all time. And I just, this is what I'm going to try to do for you guys. So I'm not saying I'm Kevin De Bruyne, and I'm not saying you're Gundogan. But what I want to do, thank you, Peter. I've never seen anybody pass like him. But what I want to do here today is really Gretzky it and try to give you guys where I think the puck's going to be, but we're still going to talk about where the puck is. And that's what we're here to talk about. So I just thought I'd bring that in for you guys to not only show you one of the, that won the league, by the way. So I don't want to get into that because people hate Man City. But where's the puck today? The puck today is all focused on how do we build AI things? <laughs> how do we how do we build AI drivers? Um, so a lot of the focus, and definitely the focus when I wrote, um, when I wrote kind of the um, summary of what we were going to do in this session is to focus here, and we still will, you know. But I want to see how it's bucketed, right? So. And we're going to use a pyramid because it's not a presentation without a pyramid, guys. I just don't know what to tell you. And I say guys to mean everybody because I'm from the Midwest, so just so you know that. Um, at the top, everybody's really focused on applied analytics, right? So this is where we take all the stuff from data mining and analytics and we actually do something with it, right? So now we're using insights, you know, now we're using, you know, findings, we're Maybe the findings were simple. Maybe the insights were simple, or maybe it took some machine learning and AI. I don't really care. Um, and then we look at data mining and analytics and we go, okay, data mining, I'm trying to find inspiration as to what's going on. Analytics, I am. I know what I want to find and I'm out to find the answer to that question. And then of course, I think where most of us have at least some experience in, including myself, because I come from a background of data governance and quality is just the data management piece. And, and that includes all of us, architects, you know, governance folks, you name it, engineers that are working hard on this stuff. So this is, in my mind, this is where the puck is. But I want us to think about where the puck's gonna be. Um, let me know in the chat if you've heard the term decision intelligence. You might have heard decision science. But at the end of the day, and if you go and Again, I don't want to advertise for that first session that I did here, or even, you know, I did do a data versity, uh, kind of my career in data with Shannon a while ago. And I just, I'm of the steadfast um, opinion that data exists to answer questions, to inform decisions that should have a positive impact. Um, this is where it's going, right? It, it's not just about, hey, <laughs> How do we do in number four, right? Good data and analytics, right? Um, decision management, okay. Yeah, I'd love to know, Ray, if you wanna let me know kind of what that means and if it's different than this, um, go for it. I, all these terms are being invented, they're all emerging. So whatever I say here is just the opinion of this, this person. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, right, there are choices that are made that kick off processes within an organization, right? And at the end of the day, that's what either drives a good outcome or a bad outcome, right? So our decisions to decide what our processes are. Our processes are how we try to enact those decisions. What actually happens are the outcomes, right? And what should be embedded in all of this, right? And although it's number four, number four on the list, number one in our heart, at the at the end of the day, you know, did we make the right decision? Was it informed? Was it data driven? Uh, was it biased? Um, what happened? You know, outcomes. So if we just think about at the end of the day, as data professionals in here, which I would argue all of us have started as data professionals, but you know, in the future, I think everybody's going to have to be a data professional. At the end of the day, this is what we have to make sure 
that we're managing against. It's not just about, you know, do we have a definition? Is it within the thresholds? Um, is it available in the way? Like, are we using Tableau, Power BI, whatever? At the end of the day, are we using data to understand outcomes and inform decisions better so that processes get better? And if you think of it this way, I think it kind of puts you a step ahead. It puts you where the puck is going to be. Because in general, the whole point of, you know, some call it data management, data governance. I always like the term enablement. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do, you know, as, as data professionals is to make sure that when decisions are made, we don't run into some of these error types. And I did these too, because um, at the end of the day, we don't want false positives or false negatives. I think we all know what that is. And you can kind of see, um, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but you know, let, let's use some high stakes stuff, right? Here's an example, you know, we conclude that a new drug is effective when it has zero effect, right? Now, now you're going to, you know, start to have, you know, false alarms, you know, maybe you're hurting people, who knows? Second type is concluding that a new drug is not effective when it actually is. Okay, so now we have the false negative, you know, total missed opportunities, like, we should be taking advantage of this, right? The third is, you know, we know that it's effective, but we kind of say, the wrong ingredient or component is the effective part of it. So like we're saying, we're basically saying that happened because of this. This type three, man, that's everywhere, isn't it? And it's what we don't talk about enough. The fact that, yeah, this happened, but it's not because of what you're saying it is. There are correlations and not causations. There's also things that just aren't related to each other. And then the first or the last type there is that, um, you know, you take data <laughs> and you use it incorrectly, right? I would say type three is, yeah, we got lucky, um, Alex. And at the end of the day, I had, <laughs> this was my VP 15 years ago, maybe when I was, uh, when I was in marketing pricing strategy. And he said, Nick, luck is not a strategy. <laughs> you know, so yeah, there's a lot of that. Some of it's malicious, some of it isn't. I would say the same thing with type four is that, you know, you're going to use data, you know, in a way to kind of prove your case. And, and that's why it's so important that at the end of the day, glad you like it, George. Um, at the end of the day, what we need to do in this room is make sure people don't make these <laughs> errors. Like I don't care what part of the life cycle of data and AI we might be in. At the end of the day, I think our job is to make sure that these don't happen. Um, now this is an eye chart guys. I, and that's why, um, I don't know. I didn't put it together to not have to go through it, but this is why I'm not gonna go through it. At the end of the day, what I just did is I took all of those things that I'm kind of telling you where the puck is going to be and just, hey, is there a way for you in your day-to-day, um, -day, whatever you do within data, to think more about, hey, am I enabling better decision intelligence? And I, I did my best to describe Hey, you have outcomes, you have processes, you have decisions, you have applied analytics, you have data mining and analytics, and you have data management. They're all a part of the same ecosystem and you can't have one without the other. And if I just start <laughs> at the top and I go, okay, do we even know how we're gonna measure outcomes? And does it actually measure the thing that we think it is? Um, Hope is not a strategy. Good one. Definitely not. Hope is not a strategy. Um, so let's think about 
how many of your companies have KPIs that actually measure what is being managed and you know clearly I when I was at Nike you know a few moons ago I spent an entire six month uh, it was it was about two quarters I think just aligning the organization on what are good demand planning KPIs because they were kind of not measuring the right things you know um I I didn't make up the meme but there is a famous meme out there that kind of says what KPI should mean and what they shouldn't mean, right? I think it says like keep people interested and all of that stuff. Look it up. Um, it's a good one. But at the end of the day, they have to be used as a learning tool, not we did good or bad, because when you do that, you end up creating all sorts of um, ways to game the system. And I would say most organizations are not very smart or clear at their KPIs. Um, if we look at the processes, you know, processes can like just not be following decisions or outcomes. That is a real thing. Um, so making sure that they're in alignment with the desired outcomes and decisions and defining KPIs, you know, KPIs don't just exist at an executive level. KPIs can exist all the way down to operational where, hey, this is the number I need to look at to make sure I'm doing the job right or that my analysis is right. For example, in demand planning, um, you know, a good KPI is just to look at seasonality of product sales and to understand, am I, if I buy X amount of black fleece, <laughs> am I blowing, am I going to flood the marketplace? with a bunch of fleece that nobody's gonna buy because we never sell that much. It's just, it's a very, it's a very important thing to just make sure that your executive KPIs tree down into operational KPIs and that they are following the decisions that are made. Now, you know, deci all decisions <laughs> are made on bias and data analysis is done on bias. And this is where it starts to come into play where, you know, everybody has a hypothesis of what they think is going to work. And as humans, you do your best to be right. That's just what we do. So I'm spending a little time on the top of this and I'm going to spend less time on the bottom because I go into more detail of those. But at the end of the day, like with these things up top are not aligned it makes our heart, you know, and I think a majority of us in here work in the bottom half of things, whether we're, you know, trying to get an analytical product out or, you know, leading some analytics or data science or data mining, or we're just trying to, you know, collect some data management, uh, collect some data and get it into a format where it can be trusted, available and um, understood. But if the top is not right, no matter what we do, <laughs> we're going to just be either reinforcing biases or we're, you know, going to be seen as not doing the job right. So I just like to show this and I just wanted to spend a little more time talking through this because I think it's super important that everybody understands the top three are just as important, if not more important than the actual data and analytics that happens. So I'm going to just go ahead and leave that there. We can come back to it if we want in the Q&A. And oh, by the way, pop stuff in the Q&A for sure. Um, I'll be happy to spend as much time as we need to um, to answer these. So let's, let's do a little bit of a deep dive. Um, you can see I'm going to keep telling you that AI is just an offshoot of analytics and I love symmetry. So let's have another thing that kind of looks like the other. Um, so it's accessible. So how I'm thinking about this um, is again, we have our data management at the bottom, architecture, integration, governance, quality, quality, privacy, security. Like those are very important. Data mining and analytics, right? You know, there's rules-based analytics, which we've talked a little bit about. And then when we start to think about using AI, you have model creation, 
And then you have model use case tuning. Those are different things. Um, and they're both equally important. And then on top of that, we need to know what are we actually aiming to do? And in general, we're applying automate, you know, applied analytics, you know, we're applying analytics and AI to one, support decisions and optimize, you know, operations, right? When we can, we can do some intelligent automation, you know, so we all know about RPA. What if we start to, you know, feed in examples to allow it to be a little more intelligent and less rule-based and hard-coded? Um, and of course, recommendations and personalization. I mean, that's what we're really trying to do is like, how do we help with a decision? How do we optimize a process? How do we automate a process? And then how do we make it specific, you know, for George or Alex or Andy, right? So, um, well, you know, I see some really good chatter and I, I love that you guys are talking to each other. Um, you know, this is kind of like a stand-up gig and you guys are um, watching me do my little thing and I like to keep an eye on the chat and I'm, I'm doing crowd work at this point, if you're familiar with that term. Um, but yeah, the whole idea of like, AI is being <laughs> sentient, right? I think, you know, yeah, like George, I saw you saw some KPI memes. There's some pretty good ones. Um, there's also a lot of memes. Um, if you go, I don't, I don't go into the Discord thing, but I do, I do spend some time scrolling around uh, Reddit, <laughs> and there's just some interesting. You know, there's a whole thing about ChatGPT and you know, it is becoming more self-aware. Um, but think about it as like, how self-aware are we as humans? You know, like, you know, things can pass the Turing test, but at the end of the day, we're always going to need humans at the helm. And I, I don't see that ever stopping. Um, and there are some things that, you know, as humans that are building <laughs> these AI models and using these AI models and building all of this. I mean, we're creating data, right? We're managing data throughout this whole life cycle. I'm showing you or landscape. There's room for bias everywhere, everywhere. Like just think about if you are, you know, <laughs> another one of my former jobs was pretty much collecting POS data from every um, every food, uh, retailer in America, we'll say, and, um, just think about what gets typed in to the register. Like there's bias in there, right? There's, you know, we have to, we have to think through this and we have to just, if we follow some clear processes, um, and we're honest with ourselves about biases going into it or biases that ex exist in data, or as I've heard from, you know, I'll call, I'll call her a data crush, right? But, um, you know, Cassie Kozikoff, who was the first uh, chief decision um, scientist at Google, but she's like, we need to use data with a lowercase d and not an uppercase d, meaning Yes, data might be a little more factual, but it's not, it's not like necessarily a fact. <laughs> like we can't treat data as the answer. We also can't use our gut. Um, so let's treat data with a lowercase d and let's make sure that we're just being cognizant of any biases that exist, you know, even ones with our stakeholders. One of the ways that she recommends is a good way to not waste your time doing analytics is to ask the person. <laughs> and she says, she calls this um, a career making question that you can ask. Um, and that career making question is what would, what data would change your mind? Because everybody's already got a decision in their head. And the idea of, if, can I tell you something that would actually change your mind, which actually tells tells you a couple things, right? What are their biases? And is there data out there that can maybe, you know, change the information their biases have been 
um, based on. So yeah, I feel like I'm just ripping off her, but she's amazing. So I'm amplifying her. Let's talk about rule-based analytics. What does it mean to enable these, right? First of all, what is it? I mean, this is basic logic, right? So, you know, if then statements, basic, you know, standard statistical approaches to things, they're out there. What do we have to make sure that we are enabling, governing, managing, whatever it is? The question is super important. <laughs> you can give an answer to a question. I mean, just, I mean, there's an election going on. So you, you know how people answer questions. Um, sometimes we don't even answer the question, right? Uh, Warwick, which is interesting too. So we answer a different question. We answer, we give an answer to a different question when we're asked the same question. Um, when we're talking about rule-based analytics, let's be very clear. These are the rules. This is the logic. Let's use peer reviews and SME reviews, right? You have to do that because when you're embarking on an analysis, people are not robots. We're finding robots are not robots, right? So you have to be very clear, some checks and balances, document transparency, transparency, transparency. One of the things I never understood, and this was back when AI wasn't such a hot commodity, but derived fields, you know, you go anywhere in an organization and they will call the same thing a different thing everywhere. How do they even talk to each other? And one of the things that I was pretty um, stringent about in, you know, the companies I've worked with is, hey, something like customer lifetime value needs to be calculated the same all across the organization. It needs to mean the same thing. Perfect, Warwick. Yes. How we define our data must be how we talk about the business, which must be consistent within the organization. And even more so, it needs to be super, super consistent with basic understanding. And then you use modifiers. We call different things different things. Love that. Um, don't skip to ride fields. How many... How many dashboards are at your company <laughs> and there's no standardization to this? It's super important um, and it happens all the time. And then, you know, it's, it's not a set it and forget it type of situation, right? You know, things change, business changes. Um, you have to monitor and iterate even on rule-based analytics. I don't, I don't know what else to call these, but if we're not... We say this about AI, but we don't say this about, um, I'll say rule-based human-driven um, analytics. We have to monitor and iterate too. You know, business goals change, um, privacy regulations change, biases change. I have to be very clear about this stuff. So AI model creation, all right, this is not, this is when you're training it. So if we just, you know, zoom out and say, very simply, for anybody who, I just like to be clear, I believe you guys all know this, but I'm going to say it, you know, GPT, it's trained, it's pre-trained, great, it's created. And then there's going to be the tuning that we're going to use for our specific thing. What goes into that? How do we help as data management professionals? <laughs> exactly, George. Uh, be sure to try to veal, as they say. Um, quality and pre-processing. Do we have diverse data sets? Are they relevant? Have they been cleaned? Have we done all the pre-processing pre -processing steps? You know, when we get to evaluation and validation, hey, what we train on is not what we should test on. <laughs> These things that, it sounds familiar, but you know, in this space of data management and around AI, like we can have, a big impact just by being there because everything's going to like trickle down to the bottom of that pyramid. Right. So we need to be sure that, Hey, this data is fit for use. You've done the right things for it. And you have a diverse set as well as a diverse set to test against. And it's different algorithms. There's not one of them. <laughs> um, 
but you got to choose the right one, right? Like I'll, I'll never, there's so many different examples I have of just picking the wrong KPI, picking the wrong analysis, pick, picking the wrong algorithm. When I, when I consult with companies, I tell them you should be using the absolute smallest AI model you can to get the job done. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The reasons are that it won't be, you know, overfit, you know, you'll be able to fine tune it easier. Um, you know, generally the most value you're going to get out of AI is if it's more and more specific to your domain and your use case um, and evaluation and validation. If your organization is creating AI models and they are not, they are not kind of following this, it, there's definitely, there's definitely a place for you to step up and, and help out. Um, now, when we get to use case tuning, this is what everybody's trying to do. Um, they like to skip the first one because they just think, hey, just point GPT at it and easy breezy, we're good to go. Not true. Uh, we have to have business architecture along data and AI architecture. What are the objectives? What are the constraints? What are the KPIs? Blah, 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 blah. Optimization, you know, before you do anything. Um, do we have the right feature engineering and selections? Uh, do we need all the ones that are in there? Do we need to change it? Um, in the case of LLMs or, you know, I'll just say LLMs, I, I've said this before, but let's, instead of large language models, let's call them large multimodal models or LMMs because, you know, we're also creating images and audio and all that weird stuff people do with deep fakes which thank God I'm married because online dating right now would be awful with all the deep fakes. Um, that's my personal opinion. But anyway, at the end of the day, first thing you have to do is optimize it. Like, and there's prompt tuning, which is used to be called prompt engineering. I like prompt tuning better, um, but you need to make sure it's ready to do what you want it to do. And then the final training, um, you know, this could be rag. This could be actual fine tuning you have to do. Um, you can, you can figure it out, but these are separate things. Um, you can't have, you can't have this one without understanding up here, which with the pre-trained models, it's already done. You just have to look into it, but also, you know, spoiler alert, those pre-trained models are in general, uh, huge bl black boxes. And that's why I say, use the smallest one you possibly can. Um, so let's get into AI for data management. And then I think I'll be, there's not much to this because I think we talked about it. Um, Mark, I'm not going to force you to pop a link in, but we talked about augmented analytics and what that means last month. This is pulled straight from that because it can help with a lot of this stuff, you know? A lot of people use it for anomaly detection, um, you know, F, all sorts of stuff here. So I won't I won't go too deep into this. But what I did want to raise the discussion about um, is the human side of data management. Right? What's the hardest part of data management? As I've been in it, it's can I actually get business people engaged so that I know what this data is supposed to be. I know what they're trying to do with it. Um, I know how they talk about it. How do we leverage AI to take those hardest parts of data management and make them easier? You know, just think about, you know, a world of data literacy, you know, the idea that we can create content so quickly. I mean, that that's the great thing is we can create content quickly. And, you know, one of the biggest things I see is people, you know, data literacy, it's not that high, guys. <laughs> I haven't, you know, there's so many folks that, you know, the reason they use their gut is because they understand it. They understand their gut. They trust their gut. Um, you know, part of, part of the, the work here 
um, in the data diversity community is to make sure that people understand what they're what they're working with. Um, and AI, it, it can help tremendously here. And just think about, okay, we talked about, I think, you know, sorry, um, I'm not going to remember. Oh, yeah, I think Warwick is the one who's who said it, but I think we we're all thinking it. Um, but thanks for saying it, Warwick, is that, you know, like a well-defined business glossary is super duper important. Um, <laughs> and, you know, what that comes down to is we have to meet data owners and data stewards where they are. Not They're not all technical. They're usually, you know, these data owners are usually very busy people. They make the decisions. Um, how can we use AI to, you know, make defining data elements easier, um, you know, engage with them, even think of just the interface of instead of, hey, go to Calibra and do this or go to Informatica and do this. How do, how do we how do we rip away what I would say is the friction that gets in the way of us being able to do a really good job of data management? And I can just see when especially as we look at these large language models, you know, and what they're really good at, which is content generation and summarize, summarization and all that stuff, it can really have a tremendous impact if we do it right. But to Warwick's point and to probably what I believe very strongly is without like some basis of understanding how the business talks, it's going to be very, very hard to help people be data owners and feel like it's not this thing they have to do, but this thing that really helps them do what they want to do um, alongside data stewards as well. So I wanted to bring that up, um, you know, Try it out. I don't just don't just stop at uh, asking ChatGPT how to define customer lifetime value. Like, actually, try to figure out how do you triangulate that with the way that your your business works and your organization talks about things, and then see see where that gets you. Um, use it to create, you know, consultancy uh, presentations that you can use to educate and try to get what you need to, you know, actually do your job easier. Um, yes, Andy, my buddy, Bob with non-invasive, it's thousand percent the right way to do it. Um, Bob, Bob's a smart guy. I'm hoping actually, and then I'm done, but I'm hoping to do, Bob and I are hoping to do some crossover, um, events with each other because, uh, you know, he's got a ton of wisdom and knowledge and, uh, you know, I think I would love to have him on this and, you know, kind of do one of those crossover episodes where we can both be on here, but non-invasive is 1000% the way. Um, so there's a cute dog with its hand up. Mark, I don't know if there's a Q and A. Um, also just happy to sit here and look at the chat and answer questions that way. Yeah, I think the chat was just so active um, that we didn't get a lot of Q&A pop in, but I do see one just pop in now. So what is the best approach to swiftly develop working AI risk management system guidelines in a big institution? That's a that's a loaded question too. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a, that's a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> hey, let's not reinvent the wheel. Um, there are large organizations that are doing that. Um, and in general, it's publicly available. And it would be great to say, guess what? Sam Altman does this <laughs> or, you know, like, uh, so I would look at look at some of the leaders in there and start from there. They, um, one of the things that they know is very important is to be very transparent and explain you know, what they're doing and why they're doing it. So don't try to reinvent the wheel. Go look at what Google's doing. Go look at what Microsoft's doing. Go look at what OpenAI's is doing. You know, look at some of the stuff on, you know, open source websites and open source developments and use those. Um, and don't feel bad because nobody's figured it out. This is why I'm not feeling bad about not having the exact answer, Mark, is 
nobody's figured it out, but there are people who at least have directionally um, a, you know, control C, control, uh, control V for you uh, if you go and look at some of the stuff they're doing. So that's my recommendation there. It was, it's funny that you mentioned that, Nick, because I was doing uh, just a scan of various different AI products and tools and, and players that are emerging out in the marketplace. And it feels to me like none of them are tackling that governance side of the house at all. <laughs> it's just like, turn on our tool and magic will happen. <laughs> uh, well, that doesn't sell. Shiny, I, I forget who said, <laughs> there's been a lot of good quotes in the chat, but you know, shiny things sell. Um, you know, for all of us here, yeah, it was Ray. I mean, you know, Mark, I know everybody in here kind of knows that um, data governance and management. Ooh, that sounds like an audit. That sounds like <laughs> yeah. you know, money that I won't get anything out of. That sounds Um, like a meeting I'm not going to like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, oh, we're going to sit there and define, you know, uh, sell through. No, I'm out of there. Um, Jesse Canada. Oh, I've just introduced. So I see Mark. I see Jesse's um, put something in there um, uh, just around hallucinations, hallucinations. And I see Jesse Canada and I think about Dave Coulier from <laughs> um, full house because I just started watch watching that with my six year old daughter. Anyway, um, hallucinations. I mean, look, you have to know. You you have to know what your model is trained on. Now, when we start using GPT, oh, it's super cool, right? Um, however, what was it trained on? The internet, <laughs> books. Like you don't know. Um, so how do you, how do you avoid those? This is where you can't get rid of the human, Jesse. This is where, um, you do need somebody who knows. <laughs> I always think about the, the scene in Goodwill Hunting where the ponytail guy tries to make Ben Affleck feel bad and thoughts and prayers with him because of the JLo thing. But, um, you know, Matt Damon knew this guy was full of crap, right? You need somebody to be the Matt Damon. And just say, no, that's not right. And that's that's how you avoid hallucinations. And that's how that's why humans don't go away. Um, they have to be SMEs, or else you will get, you know, just a bunch of wrong things that'll sound right. Right? The ponytail guy sounded really smart until Matt Damon took him down a notch. Now I'm not saying argue with AI, but at the end of the day, you need to find your Matt Damon to kind of make sure that these things aren't steering you in the wrong direction that's a great analogy I, I love that a lot and yeah how does how does ai like them apples yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's a meme coming to your linkedin at some point exactly yeah yeah i mean so um i'm seeing a lot of this uh kind of chatter and and thank you because otherwise mark and i would be like get your cues in or it's over <laughs> um so ray george jesse christopher everybody keep keep going um you know chris let's talk about red flags um red flags it's really those people saying that it just does everything right i and i i've worked with clients and you know there's there's a couple of ways, right? So if we look at, you know, one side that's really bad, it's, hey, this thing, <laughs> this this AI driver is going to make you hit a 300 yard straight like Scotty Scheffler. Nope, it's not. Um, and also the fact that, oh, you need to custom build everything. So in my mind, those are the two ends. And yeah, I've been in the services industry for, you know, the last couple of years. But you'll have a lot of service providers, mostly consultants or, you know, tech shops, right? They will tell you you have to build from the ground up. Untrue, unless it's really true. Um, but nobody in their right mind would ever tell you that without knowing enough. Because quite frankly, there's so many different services um, via cloud providers where you don't have to custom build everything. And at the other end of it is 
hey, plug this in and this is going to, you know, fix everything and you barely have to do anything. Also not true. It's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> it's going to be somewhere in the middle and it's going to be, be dependent on, are we clear on that top half of, of my eye chart, right? So are we clear on, these are the outcomes we want to drive. This is how we measure that success. These are the processes we use. This is the decision we're making. If you're clear on that, then you'll be able to um, figure that out. But at the, the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of smoke being blown, you know, up people's whatever, um, as my dad used to say. But it's red flags are any oversimplification or over, I don't think there's a term. <laughs> Um, overly making it complex, right? So I think it's important to be very clear. And, and that's why I harp so much on that top half of the eye chart is if you're clear on that, then you can ask some questions about how is it getting us towards those things. But if I were to do a blanket statement, uh, Chris, I hopefully I can call you Chris because we're buddies, but you're Christopher in the chat. Um, Anybody who's either making it too complex or too simple, it's wrong. It's it's always mama bear. It's always right in the middle. And I, I like how you say that, Nick, because it, it reminds me of like the Wizard of Oz analogy. Is it, <laughs> really, mm -hmm. there's just the man behind the curtain <laughs> half of the time. And so our there product is... uses AI to do this. It's like, really? I think that's more of just an algorithm you put together. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I... I've lived a few of these at this point, Mark, where there was um, a legal firm I was working with and they went and bought something that they said off the shelf, this is going to be your, your knowledge bot for legal services. And we're like, eh, I don't know about that. Like, but it's not hard to do, <laughs> um, but it's also not going to work a hundred percent right when you start it, right? It's going to take time to train it and reinforce it and all that other stuff. Um, and then it was, I mean, the cycles on these things are, yeah, then two months later, they were coming to us to fix it. So, um, and yeah, Ray, I consider me a little shih tzu because I'm the one who would come and expose the wizard for sure, if you need help. We're full of great trivia today, Nick. <laughs> what, kind, what kind of dog was Toto? <laughs> Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, and I think any, other uh, things? Yeah. any, any last minute questions before uh, before we wrap this up, everybody? Her interior, we did figure out what Toto was. Um, there we go. Yeah, Jesse, Jesse Canada. God, I love that name. Um, I wish I had a cool name other than Nick White. Um, <laughs> Hallucinizations, backlog them. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things, so again, that's what Microsoft and Google and OpenAI, OpenAI are doing when they give you the thumbs up or thumbs down, right? And then you can give them feedback. So that's how they're doing it. And they're doing it to their own ends. But every, every um, AI... POC or pilot or very, very small uh, application I've rolled out, I always go, okay, we need a thumbs up or thumbs down. And we also need a way to collect meaningful, you know, data because, you know, hey, it could be a hallucination. Um, it could just be some bad wiring because the way that I think about it, um, and maybe I'll... I'll definitely talk about this one day, but, um, you know, you, you shouldn't be plugging something like GPT right into something. You should always have an orchestration <laughs> because, you know, what you might want to do is take advantage of natural language processing and understanding, but then use a simple search that's been around forever or exactly. use a lookup, <laughs> you know? So part of it is like, you know, make sure that you're fully you're keeping things as simple as they possibly can, as small as they can, um, and definitely working iteratively. And then 
have those feedback loops. If you don't have those feedback loops, you're kind of, you know, not in a great spot. Um, exactly. I think that's all we have time for today, uh, Nick. We're yeah. right at the top of the hour here. Uh, so thank you everybody for uh, for coming in and thank you so much for the wonderful engagement and chat. That's so amazing. And thank you, Nick, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, just a reminder, we'll have everything posted. Uh, so slides and a recording within a couple of business days. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.